Hi, this is Richard Murray with another session of Parking Lot Theology. I want to talk to you today about Samson. I I always get excited when I read Samson's story because there's so many allegorical nuggets in it that are just so full of Jesus uh, that it's it's a it's a fun passage to read. Uh, and you know, Samson is is symbolic of the beginning of the deliverance of Israel from the Philistines. It says that Samson began the deliverance, but Samson was so off the tracks in some ways. But I would propose that Samson was off the tracks in some good ways. Now there were there were a couple of times uh, I think when he was off the track in a bad way. But for instance, um, you know he's uh, let's look at that a little bit because you know Samson was born a Nazarite, and one of the Nazarite vows that you make is that you you touch no dead thing and you don't cut your hair and that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, the the simple way to hear that is that to touch no dead thing just means that you don't touch lifelessness, that you embrace life, that you use your strength and you cleave to dynamics of life, to thoughts of life, to emotions of life, to ideas of life, to circumstances of life. We keep our hope a living hope. And that's a good thing. So to be a Nazarite means you touch no dead thing. You touch no lifeless thing. You know, I don't know about y'all, but when I'm at my worst, I, I become lifeless. I become lifeless in my uh, uh, affectations. I become lifeless in my ideas. I become lifeless in my motivations. I become lifeless in my energy. So anyway, so that's a good Nazarite though. Let's all be Nazarites in that. Let's let's touch no dead thing. And, and you know, it says that death is the last enemy that will be put underfoot by the bride, by Jesus, through his bride. Uh, that death is the last enemy. So death is just, uh, let's redefine death to mean lifelessness. Lifeless things that make us numb and, and, and just dispassionate and, and, uh, just same old, same old type of things. That, that's the things we're not supposed to touch. Well, at Samson had great strength and, and, uh, you know, he was a miracle child, uh, like many others in the Bible were. Uh, and he, he just colored outside the lines, <laughs> admittedly. But, you know, for instance, when he wanted to marry the foreign woman, uh, his parents tried to talk, you know, didn't like it. Uh, obviously he was breaking the, the cultural norms of his day to marry a foreigner. But it says in there that the Lord, but they didn't know that it was of the Lord. And think about that today. I mean, if we were to say, well, we can't marry outside of our race, what a racial thing that would be to say is. So it, at the end of the day, Samson was thinking outside the lines and he did something that actually was of the Lord. And, and, and listen, I'm the first to admit that Samson had issues with women. Uh, that, that hurt him, that hurt Israel. But again, I think these are more symbolic things. We get a lot more from the Old Testament if we see each Bible hero as a particular dynamic. And to me, uh, Samson just personifies passion. I'm not so much interested in Samson the person because we don't know a whole lot about his inner thoughts and all that. And um, this is a this is an allegory, and it's an allegory that is full of Christological manna. For instance, uh, Samson carries the Gaza gates uh, uh, up on the hill. He tears them off their hinges. Well, that's a type of Jesus. Uh, tearing the gates of hell, carrying away the gates of hell. Uh, and, uh, Samson at the end of his life puts his hands outstretched in the form, in the shape of a cross to push the temples down on the Philistines. But these Philistines aren't to be seen as living, just as Samson's not to be seen as a living person, but as a living dynamic. So the Philistines, for instance, would represent enemy thoughts, uh, unworthy thoughts, dead thoughts, lifeless thoughts, angry thoughts, hateful thoughts. And Samson would be the, the, the passion of the Lord that would come up and uh, use the jawbone of an ass. You know, he, he slayed a thousand Philistines. Well, we can slay Philistine thoughts. We can slay unworthy thoughts. We can slay uh, uh, thoughts that are touched by uh, lifeless thoughts. We take those prisoner, as Paul said. So again, we, we see manna here, and, and it's exciting to see Samson stand up to these things and fight them. And even though he had the great failure with Delilah when he became manipulated uh, and uh, fell into, you know, fell into that trap uh, and he lost his eyesight, but you know, his hair grew back, his hair got cut, but his hair grows back. And we need to take that, uh, the, the, you know, that even with Jesus, Jesus died, but he came back. All right. The, the, his hair grew back, his strength grew back and he, and he escaped hell and led captivity captive. Uh, for us. So Jesus is all throughout the, uh, the, the Samson story. And I love it. It's exciting. And, uh, I love that Samson just went out there and he acted from his passions. Now he needed, you know, as a human, if we do look at it as a human, he obviously had some unsanctified passions, but his, he had a life of great victory and a life of great strength and gifting. 
And again, if we can tap into that same, if we can tap into that same spirit and see Samson, not, not as a, as a person, but as, not as a heroic person, but as a heroic spirit, as a heroic dynamic, then we can use that and we can see Jesus all over his life. God bless y'all.